start with this one because this one should come close to home. This little booklet I put together just to show you. You have a press release. Why Dory Miller? Why is it important for us to get that medal? And you see this? This is the, you probably don't know what this is. And I didn't know when I got to Congress. This is our nation's highest military award. It's called the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor. We have three uh, branches in the armed service. You have one of these? I get, I, did I give you one? You got one. Okay. You have three branches in the armed services. Each one has their own medal. And Dory Miller has the highest medal for the Navy. It's called the Navy Cross. Uh, but he doesn't have the Medal of Honor. And he did something so heroic, as you'll see from the thing that I gave you. If you don't have one of these, uh, you know, some came in late. They think that you'll, you'll read about Dory Miller. And it, it's great. You know, sometimes things happen, and you don't know why they happen. But this gave me something to do. I have a lot of things that I do for human rights, for people who can't or to hire people like me. There's a lot of congressmen, what they do, they leave Congress, they stay in Washington, they make a lot of money as lobbyists. I didn't do that. But I became a registered lobbyist because if you approach a congressman on anything and you're not registered, that could be a felony or a misdemeanor. So I have to file a lot of papers even though I don't get paid for what I do. I help people in the Balkans who are being deprived of their human rights. And this is something that I'm doing now for 30 years. When I started in Congress, it was 1985. No one gave me any chance to be elected. I was a poor kid. I shouldn't say poor. My parents were like lower middle class from the Bronx. They came here in 1929 with no education from Italy, believe it or not. That's why I have this long Italian name, Dio Guardi. And uh, my father was 15, and here he is, 1929. His father's ill, he's got three sisters and a mother, so he's now the one that has to support the family, he, and he's now in Harlem. Because in those days, there's a big Italian-American community that came off the boat to Ellis Island that was in Harlem. So here he starts shining shoes, you know, just to make some money. Um, but then he found out that the Yankee Stadium was very close, because everybody knows where the Yankee Stadium is, very close to the Bronx Terminal Market where all the farmers come in from uh, Long Island. And they have crates of lettuce and collard greens and mustard greens and kale and whatnot. And my dad was very clever. He realized that the African Americans in Harlem liked greens. So he went and bought those crates and he was only here for less than a year. He puts them on a corner of 125th Street and he starts selling the greens off. Four years later, he has a store in what they call Sugar Hill today, 145th Street. And he comes here with nothing. He meets my mother in the Bronx. She was a, an immigrant too from Italy, but they didn't meet in Italy, they met here. And she said, Joe, you can't believe your dad. In 1934, when I met him, he was only here five years. He already had a car with a silver wheel, and he was the only one in the Bronx that had a radio in a car. This guy came here with no education, couldn't speak a word of English, and he was motivated to do something for his family and for himself. And what you heard Martin McDonald say about signing this and signing that, that's discipline, about coming every week here. That's perseverance. Why are these things important? Because you guys are going to want to get a job. You're going to make some money. You want to support a family. You want to make a life for yourself. You want to go on a vacation. You want to have, hopefully, a complete life. You can't have a very complete life in this very competitive country unless you succeed in school. Why is school so important? Why did I succeed? Because I did well in school. I had a very tough mother and father. They had a grocery store in the Bronx. I had to get up, you know, after school every day. I had to go there. And then I still had to go home and study two or three hours homework. I was in a very... See, my parents knew that they couldn't succeed because they had no education. But they made sure that I had a good education. But I had to work for it. My father was tough. I could have gone to a public school where it didn't cost anything. My mother insisted, no, he's got to go to that Fordham prep on Fordham Road where those Jesuit priests are. 
and that's where I went to high school. And they were tough. And many times, the guys that I went to school with, all these rich kids from Westchester County in those days, because Fordham has a great reputation, like the Jesuits, they're very progressive. They mix up kids that have money and kids that don't have money. And I was one of these kids that didn't have money. My parents, uh, you know, were surviving, but we didn't have, you know, a big house. In fact, I remember going, one of my friends, father took a liking to me and invited me to Scarsdale. As I said, I was living in the Bronx around that uh, Italian-American neighborhood, Arthur Avenue. And when I went there, um, I'm having dinner with them in a dining room. I didn't know that people had dining rooms. And this is 19, what, 50, what, what was my first year? Of, uh, yeah, my sophomore year, 1956. We just had my 60th anniversary of my graduation from Fordham Prep and I was one of the co-chairmen of it. It's hard to believe 150 from that class is less than 100 left. So you're gonna see as you get older, you know, we only last about 100 years, if you're lucky. <laughs> you know, people start going. Now, that means you've got a limited amount of time. It's not an emergency. You don't have to get up at night worrying about it. But life is a progression. It's, it's taking one step at a time where you're building on your experiences. But why is it so important what Martin McDonald told you? Because when you go get a job, the only way that people are going to know that they can trust you is looking at what you did before. Did you perform? Did you accomplish something? What are your marks? Did you do some extracurricular activities? Did you go in a neighborhood and raise some money for a good cause, like apparently what you're doing now? These things all add up, and people say, you know, I'm going to give the, I don't know this person, don't know his family, but I see here that he's worth making a bet on, and I'll see how he performs. And if that's a good person hiring you, he'll accept some mistakes in the beginning, as people should when you're getting started. I was a waiter working my way through college, all right? We moved in 1957 to Greenberg. My dad saved his money, and he bought finally a house. We had to. I have a sister and a brother, I'm the oldest. And we were all living in one bedroom, believe it or not. We had kept pull out beds because my dad was so insecure about money and survival, he wanted to make money and he wanted to save it. And he wanted to do something for his family to give them a boost. And finally, he just went around. I remember going with him in the cars because he had all these bank books. He saved the money from 1934. I had all these bank books and 10,000 in this bank, 5,000 that. He was just someone who said, Joe, you got to work, but if you don't save something, you're going to be a hostage to somebody <coughs> else. So you got to have that in mind, too, that at some point when you start making money, that you start putting some aside for that rainy day, which we're not doing in America. I'm going to leave you a copy of my book, Unaccountable Congress. Do you hear that word, unaccountable? What does that mean? They're not counting right. They're not spending right. In Washington today, we have spendthrift people who are spending money we don't have, borrowing from countries you don't trust, like who? China, Russia, and that's how, why we sell all these treasury bonds. They buy them because it's the safest thing in the world to own right now. But that's your debt. Someone has to pay off on those bonds later on because someone's spending that money now. That's another subject. So I'm, I'm starting to tell you that I'm a product of what you're hearing. The nuns that I had, now I went to a, my parents were Catholic people and the religion was important to them because when you don't have anything, religion is, is something that gives you faith, hope, and hopefully charity as well when you can afford to be, uh, you know, giving to others. And the nuns in that school were very tough. You miss one class. They're already calling your mother and father and, 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 and then I get it from them. Uh, I don't see enough of that happening in our public school systems where a lot of people are getting away with not going every day to school. You got to show that. Then I had that discipline. I go to Fordham Prep. And then those Jesuits that taught me were very tough. They're called the Marines of the Catholic Church. You need to have 13 years before you become a priest as a Jesuit. Our current Pope now is a Jesuit. I don't know if you know that. And then I went to Fordham University to be an accountant. And I became a good accountant. Let me get back to this because this is how I'm giving back. Uh, this makes me feel good about myself today. 
you know, you guys are not 20 yet, I don't think, right? I was just 78. That's a long amount of years between where you are and I am. And you might say, oh my God, I can't, how am I going to get to where this guy Joe went? You don't know what you're going to be when you grow up. In fact, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. I'm still having fun with life. I got 20 more years. You're in the first quarter of your life, I'm in the last quarter of my life. And I'm still looking like this is my whole life. And I want to do something important so that when I leave here, this particular planet, wherever we go, whatever you believe, that I leave something behind so that my children are proud of me, my friends from school are proud of me, but guess what? I want to be proud of me. It's called self-esteem. When you like yourself, you begin to become likable to others. If you don't like yourself, people see that. It's a sign of insecurity, a sign that, that, that you don't think you can succeed. Now, not all of you can have that feeling right now, I know I'm going to succeed. No. It's an unknown, like it was an unknown to me. I didn't know what I was going to be. I thought I was going to be an attorney. But then I got an internship because I had straight A's in accounting in college, and they convinced me to go to represent the school, and they said, you know what, if you do this, we're going to give you A's in all your final exams in the midterms, all right? I forget what I got to lose, I'm doing it. I go to this accounting firm, public accounting, the world's largest accounting firm at that time, Arthur Anderson, where I spent 22 years really being trained the right way in accounting. And I brought that experience to Congress with me. You're going to read my book, and you'll see how I'm criticizing from 30 years ago the way we are spending your money, the people's money. Okay, and I'm still doing it. I just gave a speech in Washington, and it's going to be published next week in The Hill magazine. You know what the title is? The American Dream in Crisis, the coming of the $1 trillion annual interest payment. I'm writing it for you. I'm trying to save your generation from this huge debt that nobody wants to pay off today. And they don't even balance the books so that every year we have a deficit. What's a deficit? Let me tell you. A deficit is the difference between what you raise, taxes, the government, and what you spend. That gets added to the debt. By the way, I'm the first CPA elected to Congress. And this is an issue I like to talk about to young people, but I'm going to make sure I talk about this issue of black Americans and why this is such an important issue today. When I got to Congress in 1985, look at the front page. Now, Leroy, Dr. Ramsey, he was a military historian. He comes to my office. He says, Joe, I didn't vote for you. Now, now Vernon had a very large African-American population. I ran as a registered Republican, but I'm a different kind of Republican. I'm someone who found it very easy to go across the aisle, even to the head of the Black Caucus. You see him here, Mickey Leland. Now you see, 1989, he died delivering food to the poorest people in the world at that time, Ethiopia. They had a, a drought, no food could be raised there, and, and medicine, a plane. Him, a couple of other congressmen, a delegation, went down, everybody died. Two years before that, I start this thing because this Leroy Ramsey comes to me and says, Joe, you know, you were the only one to answer a letter that we had Governor Cuomo <coughs> send to all 34 congressmen from New York State. In those days, we had 34, 17 Republicans, 17 Democrats. Now, he comes to me and he says, you answered this letter. You were the only one. And in fact, he called me first. Can I come to see you? I said, of course. Then he explained to me, as I said, why don't we talk about that letter again? I remember you told a story that I could hardly believe. And you know what he tells me? A million five hundred and fifty thousand black Americans, African Americans, served World War One, World War Two, and not one, not one got our nation's highest award. It's on the front of the page. You see it? That's the Medal of Honor. Every armed services, the Navy, Army, and Air Force has their own medal. In the Navy. It's called a Navy Cross. But if you do something that's so her heroic, that transcends what normal coverage is, you can then be recommended by your commanding officer for the Medal of Honor. It's given by the president. Now, these days, I think it may be seen on TV and doing it in the White House. I was just in the White House uh, on June 2nd, 2015, 
and I finally got the medal for Sergeant Henry Johnson from Albany. I started with that one in 1987. When I went to Mickey Leela, I was pretty clever. I knew what I didn't know. And I said to myself, how am I going to now get started on this great thing? I have a large African-American population. They're my constituents, whether they voted for me or not. And this is something important to them. So I said, let me go find the head of the Congressional Black Caucus, Mickey Leela, the guy who died two years after in Ethiopia. And I had helped him on something. I had forgotten about it. But he needed a Republican because President Reagan wanted to eliminate food stamps. And he came to me, he says, I heard you speak, and I looked at your district in Westchester. Your district is like mine in Houston. You have a lot of rich people, and you have a lot of poor people. And I'll bet you don't want to see those food stamps go either. I said, well, I didn't give it much thought. But now that you're mentioning it, why can't you get another republic? Well, it's just a political thing. And I need someone to testify in front of the Agricultural Committee. He says, Mickey, you've convinced me. I come from a poor neighborhood in the Bronx. Before we move to Westchester, I'm going to do this. Not knowing I would need him for these medals. So when I went to him to say, I need you to help me sign a bill to waive the statute of limitations. You want to get a medal for a, a hero, you have five years. If you don't do it in five years, you have to go back to Congress, and it's called a bill to waive the statute of limitations. So when you look at this book, you see the one that we signed in 1987, Mickey and I, for seeing and doing millets in there. And we did that. But I couldn't get anywhere with it because the Navy resisted it. Oh, we did it. In fact, the problem was, we find out now, the guy who was the Secretary of Defense, his name was Frank Knox, when Dory Miller, during Pearl Harbor, did some unbelievable stuff, he was a racist. You know, he just didn't want to see a black American be the first one in World War II to get a medal. So he never made anything move. So here I am now, 77 years later, working on this, and now I'm pretty close to doing it. Why? It was an honor for me to be invited to speak at the annual meeting of the Congressional Black Caucus. Have you ever heard of the Congressional Black Caucus? It's now up to 50, it was 49. Now with the new people voting in the House, it's going to be, it looks like, 54. So we have, out of 435 members in the House, 54 of them are African Americans, male and female, by the way. A lot of females now coming in. So I get an invitation from the Black Caucus. They have something called the Veterans Brain Trust to come down and speak of what I've been doing. I was the only one that was Republican. And besides the Secretary of, of Veterans Affairs, who was white, I was the only other white person in this thing for three days. Okay? So I just wanted you to know. So I started this. In 1987, and if you read the book, you'll see that I've gotten nine medals. I'm up to number 10. No one ever did that. People would tell me, Joe, you're crazy. You, you know, it's not going to happen. They resist it too much. And when I hear things like that, then I say, it's worth doing. If it's going to be that tough, I want to do it. If it was easy, everybody could do it, correct? When things are tough, that's when some people have to say to themselves, I'd like to be the one to break that racial door down. So I'm the one who broke the racial barrier. Now you might say, well, why did this happen in World War I, World War II? President Woodrow Wilson was a racist. Why do you think they tried to remove his statue at Princeton University? He was born in Richmond, Virginia. And he had this thing. In those days, I guess, you know, if you're born in certain neighborhoods, you're born with this uh, ideology that, you know, why, why do we have to help the black people? Something like that. Who knows? I'm not there. I lived in a racially mixed neighborhood. That's why I think it was good for me to go to Congress and find out about these things, because I ventured with very few people who venture to go, because I was very comfortable with black people, Irish people, Italian people, you name it, because that was my neighborhood. And that's one of the problems we have in America today. People don't live next to each other that are different. We're kind of finding ourselves in, they used to be called ghettos. When my dad came here, in the neighborhood where they were all Italian. When the Jews came here from, you know, escaping the Nazis, they went into areas where the Jewish people. That's natural. Because you want to be with people that know who you are, know about you and, and your problems. 
So here I am, and I just came back from a trip from Washington, and I went to Eddie Bernice Johnson, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. She was the one that I met back in the 80s from Waco, Texas. That's where Dora Day comes from. And she paid me big respect during this conference. She got up and told everybody who I was and how I was doing this with her for so many years. And it looks like she, well, she's agreed now to get every one of those African American congressmen and congresswomen to sign a letter with me and her to send to President Trump. It's going to happen in a week or two to say, you need to do this. Because if the Navy doesn't do it, the only one that can override the Navy or the Air Force or the Army is the President, because he's the Commander in Chief. And he's done it a couple of times before. So I left it a booklet. You take it and read it and look at the stuff from the prior years, the articles that appeared in Westchester County, where they're saying good deed by a former congressman. They didn't know when I, you know, lost that race. I was only there four years, two terms, because I was in a district that had four times more Democrats than Republicans. Everybody says it was impossible to win. I won it. I did good work. But then they started playing games of redistricting, and I tried to come back in another district. Didn't happen. But did I give up? Give up? No. I formed three nonprofit organizations. One is Truth in Government. Another one is the Albanian American Civic League. Uh, that's for the rights of people in the Balkans that were being really repressed. My father came here speaking Italian and Albanian. It's a long story. Why would he speak Albanian coming from Italy? Because 500 years ago, the Ottoman Turks overran Albania, and Albania and Italy were only 40 miles apart, and tens of thousands ran into what was then the southern part of Italy called the Kingdom of Naples. Italy wasn't made a unified country until 1861. Now, I want to educate you now for all that, but as you get older, you're going to bump into these facts, and you're going to learn them, because there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know that I learned along the way. So with that, I would tell you that um, an idea I have, if you guys succeed and you listen to this great man here, Martin McDonald, I kind of almost tongue-in-cheek kidding around told him, you know, if you really want to do something for these young African-American kids, we've got to take them to Washington with me. So I can take them inside the House of Representatives, take you to the, show you the original Supreme Court that was closed down in 1865, then they built it across the street. It's still there. It's in the Capitol. And the Library of Congress, the original Library of Congress, was in the Capitol. Now it's a huge building. It goes down about seven floors, probably the biggest library in the world. It would be my honor to show you the real inside of Washington, and we have to figure out how we do that. So I'm going to leave you with this. Read it, and I, I will keep you informed as we go on to let you know what's going on with this. I see you have, no, it's not my book, that's your book. I'm going to give you also, before I leave, my book, Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. And I'm going to also give you the copy of the speech that I gave in Washington about two months ago, the American Dream in Crisis. This is your problem, because if we don't start getting our arms around spending, and spending it on the right things, Obviously, we can't stop spending. But this government last year spent $4 trillion. That's with a T. Trillion. $4 trillion. And two-thirds of that is on automatic pilot. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, military pensions, things like that. So that leaves about one-third what they call discretionary spending for all the other things you need. Education, Homeland Security, Defense. And I spell it out in my article the charts so you can see that now that interest is going up and the national debt's going up, that interest in five years is going to surpass defense spending in the budget. That $4 trillion is the budget. And I got, I, I'm going to give you some charts in there so you can see what's made, what's made up for. Now, you're not really in a class for political science, and you guys are in high school yet, right? When you get to college, these are some of the things you're going to want to know about. So I've got an opening your eyes right now about some of the challenges you're going to face in the future. With that, I'd like to answer any questions you might have. And before I leave, I'm going to give you that the book. And, and you have my card. If you don't have my card, you can take it from that. Go ahead. Um, you said you had like nine medals. You like to Not me. me. Oh. They were given to African Americans who deserved those medals. 
I remember, you, I, did I tell you that we had segregation because of Woodrow Wilson? Woodrow Wilson segregated the entire U.S. government. African Americans who survived slavery, survived the Civil War, survived Reconstruction, which didn't really work. The whites in the South didn't want Reconstruction to work. But they did. They went to Washington, where they got pretty good jobs with the government. And you'll see stories. I've read a couple of these stories. It brings tears to your eyes. How people who were subject to all those disadvantages got a good job, saved money, had a house, some had some farms in and around Washington, Virginia, Maryland. Here, Woodrow Wilson comes, and most of them were working for the government. They all were fired. One, two, three. And replaced by whites. This is 1913, 14, 15. You don't know that, do you? I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know when I was 20, 30. I had to go to Congress to find out the disadvantages that African Americans were put under in this country. And they still are not, they're still not out of that. And you might say, why is it important for you to listen to Martin and listen to me? Because competition is going to be tough. And you still have some disadvantages as African Americans. So you have to do what I did. My long Italian name didn't help me. There was a lot of discrimination against Italian Americans when I went into the accounting profession in 1962. There was even a mafia guy with exactly my name, Dio Gordy, Johnny Dio. A lot of people were thinking maybe I had a connection. Uh, my dad looked for you. The point is, I had to show them who I was, not by complaining, but by working, by doing much better than the other people. I started with 100 people in this accounting firm in the New York area, and, and 100 people in the firm. But I was in New York, started in Arthur Anderson. Ten years later, only two made point, and I was one of them. You're going to find your own path in life, but you heard what Mr. McDonald said. You are going to be known by people who don't know you, by how you perform. How did you do in school? Are you someone interested in the community? Are you uh, someone who has stayed out of trouble? There's obviously schools a record, getting in trouble is a record, and when people want to take a bet on you for a job, a good job, they're going to want to know, did you perform? Can I trust you? And the only way they can start thinking that way is by looking at how you perform in school, in your neighborhood, and in a thing like Black Times that you're doing here, which is going to be a plus because of who he is and, and how he just defined how you can perform. And in life, you have to create options for yourself. You know what options are? Choices. Don't go down one tunnel here. Uh, you have to think about who am I, what do I like, uh, who am I surrounding myself with, and that's important. Because as you get older, you want to be with people who are better than you. There's an old expression my father told me in Italian. Uh, he said it with an Italian accent. Fetile che una meglio di te e fangeli spes. You know what that means? Find someone better than you and pay their expenses. In other words, take them out to lunch. That's when you learn things. When you take people out that are better than you, that have succeeded, you don't just get there. You can't go out today on the street or in school and say to the teacher, I want to take you out to lunch. That doesn't work. But as you get older in life, you want to be in those charities where you can be on committees with other people that are doing what you're doing, but maybe they succeeded a bit more. And then maybe you go on the board the way I did at the Phoenix House. When I went on that board, five of the people on that board were New York Stock Exchange chairman. Kraft Foods, Texaco, PepsiCo. And I started to get to know them. They got to know me. They became my biggest supporters. It doesn't happen overnight, but you got to start someplace. And Black Diamonds is a very good way to start. Because the discipline I got from my parents, who suffered so much to get over to the United States in 1929, and the discipline I got from those Catholic nuns and those priests, they wouldn't let you get away with anything. If you were not in school for a day or an hour, let me tell you, they'd, they'd be held to pay. And that's kind of like what you're being taught now. You've got to be persistent at what you do, You've got to be consistent, 
doing it one time after another. And you've got to make sure that you see it as good discipline. Because discipline is a habit. You either pick it up or you don't. If you don't have that discipline, checking off that box every time, and you miss it a couple of times, it's easier then to miss it two or three more times. That's the way life is. So with that, again, any other questions? I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, you're going to read about me here. You're going to read about me. I got two other things. The article, The American Dream in Crisis, that's you. You're in crisis 10, 20 years from now. This doesn't stop. And I'm working on it. I'm speaking around the country. And then the book, On Account of the Congress, I brought for you too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.